program is classified M. It may contain coarse language, sexual references and adult themes. Hey comrades, thanks for coming to this meeting. Uh, first of all, hail socialism. Hail, hail socialism. socialism. Now, it's the final week of tonightly and I just don't want us to end. We can't stop now. We haven't brainwashed enough young people with the ideas of cultural Marxism. Or identity politics. Yes. Or global warming propaganda. God, we were so damn close! Well, definitely so what that close. disgusting song was about. If we had one more season, we'd be about totally hypocrisy and Scott Morrison's record. That funny and scathing satire. This is why the ABC has got to redo us. We've got to do something, something extraordinary to convince the ABC that Tonightly should stick around. Yeah, what are we supposed to do though? Scott Morrison is the Prime Minister. Yeah, and the coalition government clearly want to shut us down because of our scathing and powerful truth bombs. Yeah. Mm. They're never going to renew us, even though we're so funny and we're always correct. Always correct. Yeah, not unless we do a conservative half hour on ABC comedy. Can <laughs> 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 you imagine that? <laughs> 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 Let's do that. Yeah, that'll yeah. that'll work. Thomas C. Ballard, welcome to the show. Now, some of you might know this show with a different name, full of lefty lunacy on fucking their ABC. Well, I want to assure you, everyone that's watching, from an ABC executive to the Minister for Communications, that's all behind us now, and we here at Conservatively are very happy to provide some bloody common sense for once. How about that, everyone? Oh. Yes. You know the thing about common sense, don't you? It's not very common. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> I'm going to be trying to talk in some common sense to my guest tonight, Greens leader, communist and traitor Richard Di Natale, everyone. I know, I know, I know, I know. And because this is ABC comedy, we're also have a performance from a so-called comedian, Chris Fleming, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Hope everyone had a good Father's Day. Everyone had a good Father's Day? Yeah. Shout out to all the fathers out there. <laughs> Obviously not the gay ones, but the fathers, <laughs> what up? Some people think that I'm gay, actually. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> no, Marie and I are very happy. And, um... <laughs> she couldn't make it tonight, but she's a fan. And I think, on the matter of Father's Day, Ross Cameron of Sky News said it best yesterday morning. So, we want to say to all the fathers out there, whatever your defects, uh, we love you. <laughs> yep, I think that's a very normal and... <laughs> and good thing to say. Well done. Uh, speaking of defects, Bill Shorten. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All right, he claims to be your father, and he celebrated yesterday by tweeting, even on Father's Day, the weekly shopping needs to be done. No, Bill, this is heresy. A man doing the shopping on Father's Day is like eating Turkish bread on Anzac Day. It's a disgrace! <laughs> it's a disgrace! <laughs> Opposite. Anyway... <laughs> I can't help but notice that in that photo you can see that Bill Shorten's cereal of choice is Kellogg's Corn Flakes. <laughs> well, trust Bill Shorten to pretend he's in touch with a working man when really he's splashing his cash everywhere on the lavish taste sensation that is Corn Flakes. <laughs> la dee da Bill Shorten! <laughs> you know what Scott Morrison has for breakfast? Coal. OK, like a good... <laughs> ..bloody Aussie. Look at Bill Shorten doing the shopping like a woman. Man, imagine if he was a woman. I think he'd look a little something like this. Ha ha! <laughs> oh, classic man in a dress never gets old. Now, I gotta say, I think this conservative thing is going pretty well for us right now. Ooh! Oh, that's the Tonightly phone. Who could that possibly be? Hello? Uh, good morning, Tom. I'm Alan Jones. Alan Jones, everybody! <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Thanks I just thought I'd pop a call in to congratulate you on the new direction you've taken. I bloody love it. Yeah? Yes, almost as much as I love Anthony Kalia. Oh, what a voice. Oh, <laughs> he oh, really loves oh, Anthony Kalia. Oh, Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. I, I know. I can do jokes too, Tom. You, you can do jokes? Yes, yes. Uh, would you like to hear a joke? Oh, I have a joke from you, Alan, as long as it doesn't involve the N-word. Oh, uh, can I call you back? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just kidding, just kidding. I do have a joke you for you. you got another joke. All right, let's hear it. Wait, How wait. many Greens voters... Oh, sorry. I've got it. Let me start again. OK, let's start, start again. again. Yeah, I'm not good. that good with jokes. We've got all the time yeah. in the world. You how do fucking... Greens voters keep their breath fresh? I don't know. How do Greens voters keep their breath fresh? With entitled mints. <laughs> 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 oh, no. Just kidding. 
just kidding. Greens voters don't have fresh breath. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were here on the ABC yesterday. ABC so-called journalist Matthew Doran tweeted a video of Scott Morrison's interaction with a small boy at a childcare centre with the caption posted without comment. See this disgrace for yourself. I got a comment, Doran. That's fucking disgusting. <laughs> Look at that little traitor just wandering away, happy as you like. We did some research on that kid. Turns out, surprise, surprise, never worked a day in his life. How about that? <laughs> Probably in the CFMEU, yeah? <laughs> Thanks a lot for tweeting that out, ABC's Matthew Doran, who also appears to be a small boy who hates the Prime Minister. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> Still in the news is Liberal MP Julia Banks, who I like because her last name is Banks and Banks are good. <laughs> <laughs> I used to like Julia Banks, that is, until I found out she's a whinger. Victorian-based MP Julia Banks has announced today that she'll be leaving Parliament at the next election. The last straw, she says, with the events of last week and the bullying and intimidation she faced. Toughen up, Julia. As Andrew Bolt pointed out, you didn't name one bully or say how you'd been bullied or when it happened. You just had to claim to be a victim and you'll believe. So, Julia, if your lady feelings can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. No, get back in the kitchen. Oh, fuck, this is hard. <laughs> Being a conservative is exhausting. I need a bit of a pick-me-up. Do we have that cup of uh, Sarah Hansen Young's tears we had standing by? Thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That isn't Sarah Hansen Young's tears. That's a soy latte, for God's sakes. <laughs> oh, fuck, that's good. All right. <laughs> All right, where were we? Oh, God. Yellow oh. Ellen. Oh, 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 Tom, this is hysterical. <laughs> oh, it's truly a masterpiece. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah. Oh, 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 I think those women should stop complaining too. <laughs> yeah, right. We should oh, take women. them all out to the sea and dump them in a chaff bag. Oh, you said say. it, brother. <laughs> 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 Uh, now, can I say the N-word, please? No, stop asking! <laughs> that is annoying. Yeah. Let's have some good old-fashioned uh, culture wars. That's always fun. Back in June, Premier of Socialist Victoria, Daniel Andrews, announced plans to build Australia's largest contemporary art gallery in Melbourne. Well, someone who isn't very happy about that is tonight the contributor, James McCann, who's an actual conservative, OK? He's actually written for Quadrant magazine and stuff, so... <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we gave him some of your hard-earned taxpayer money to make this. Melbourne is sad and often wet. Its beaches are covered with feces and syringes. There's lots of crime, although depending who you ask, it's either gang crime or sad, atomised, lonely crime. And yet, despite all that, Melburnians have always thought themselves superior. They think they live in a Philistine nation, but a civilised city. Despite the fact that television happens in Sydney, government happens in Canberra, and I happen in Adelaide, people in Melbourne think they live in the nation's cultural capital. It isn't smugness, it's desperation. They need a reason to believe, however incoherent, that the place they live is worthwhile. The Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews, has announced a brand new modern art gallery. That's not because people love modern art. In fact, when you poll them, the average person doesn't even think modern art is art. Both Sydney and Adelaide are getting brand new modern art galleries. Even Tasmania has one, and those people don't even have a football team. It's all very embarrassing for the cultural elites in Melbourne. So, despite skyrocketing debt, the Victorian state government has decided to blow millions into a new modern art gallery to be known as NGV Contemporary. Is it gonna work? Can you buy culture with an art gallery? Well, yes, if by culture you mean showing David Walsh and the Satanists down in Hobart who's got more money, but no, if you actually care about people and their lives. Art is supposed to make you feel something, but walking around a modern art gallery, the most common feeling is one of indignation. <laughs> This is the original NGV building in Melbourne. Currently, they're showcasing a selection of works from MoMA, New York's Museum of Modern Art. 
Why has Jeff Coons put these vacuum cleaners in Perspex boxes? Why has John Chamberlain done that to those cars? Were they bad? Why is that wall bleeding? And why is that lady's face so damn big? And why are there five of them? Why is it all here? Why do they want me to spend money on it? I could be doing anything. I could be watching sport. I could be making love. I could be knocking back some cold and flu tablets in the bath with a bottle of red. I could be injecting heroin between my toes. I could be climbing a tree. I could be adoring the Blessed Sacrament. I could be in the older, better part of the art gallery with the beautiful art. Of course, when wandering around a modern art gallery, those who wish to seem modern themselves mask their disgust. They're afraid of seeming small-minded or uneducated or stupid. Well, I'm here to tell you not to be afraid. This is shit. <laughs> and this isn't art. This is a pile of bricks. And this isn't art. This is a woman's bed. And do you know why I'm shooting this in front of a green screen? Because the cowards at the NGV wouldn't even let us inside to shoot. This is a far cry from the great masters of yesteryear. If Leonardo da Vinci were alive today, he'd be 566 years old. Much too old to care about modern art. He'd be blind and demented and have wrinkly skin and his bones would be soft as eggshells. Also, this painting is bad. It's true, art has become more diverse, but in the process, it has become uniform and also boring. In the words of art critic slash manic pixie dream lesbian Camille Paglia, certain artistic movements are underrepresented in art museums and minimised or ignored by many art humanitarians, partly because they do not support the ruling paradigm of art as leftist resistance. Those who claim to speak for contemporary art are not being truthful. Their work is neither good nor beautiful. <laughs> this is where Daniel Andrews is going to build his new art gallery. Now, at least when this was the Carlton United Brewery head office, something happened here. The creation of beer that improved people's lives. You can't say that about modern art. If there is a silver lining, it is this. When all of the modern art is moved out of the NGV proper and into the NGV contemporary, it shall all be in one place where, God willing, it can be wiped out in a freak art gallery accident. <laughs> Conservatively now, but back when we were that lame lefty show tonightly last week Some people got really angry at us for a so-called comedy song we broadcast in which we ridiculed the Prime Minister Scott Morrison for his Christian faith And that was definitely what that disgusting song was about and to all those people out there who say it was actually making a point about hypocrisy and Scott Morrison's record on refugee policies Well, I have something to say about that, but We don't have time <laughs> See, the problem with that awful song last night was the hypocrisy. Oh, sure, tonight they was happy to take the mickey out of Scott Morrison, the Christian, but would they do the same if the Prime Minister was a Muslim? <laughs> I highly doubt it. Coming up, I discuss what to do if our Prime Minister actually becomes a Muslim. <laughs> Are your children safe? No. <laughs> now... <laughs> <laughs> This question of the Muslim double standard has been reflected across the common sense media. In The Spectator, Daisy Cousins suggested that if Tom Ballard really wanted to be cheeky, he should have commissioned a song and dance routine about incoming New South Wales Green Senator Maureen Faruqi's Muslim faith, a Pakistani-inspired musical commentary about burqas and female genital mutilation. <laughs> now that's edgy. That is a fantastic suggestion, Daisy. Thank you so much. I have already written that song, and it can be found on my upcoming album, Tom Ballard's Cheeky Songs, satirising the assumed beliefs of low-profile Australian politicians with little to no legislative power. Good. Get out and buy it, people. It's the perfect gift for Ramadan. <laughs> my favourite man ever, Andrew Bolt, said that he actually enjoyed the skit. Oh, it's extremely funny. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> But he did have some feedback in response, writing, Fine, now mock a Muslim like you mocked a Christian. Well, here at Conservatively, we agree and think that's a great idea. So it's time for our new segment, Mock a Muslim! <laughs> Finally! <laughs> All right, you guys? Well, tonight's Muslim...
Muslim will be mocking is Rodney. Hello, Rodney. Good evening. And Allah Akbar. Why? <laughs> Good. All right, now, I've done a lot of research for this. I haven't talked to any uh, actual Muslims or read the Quran, but I have watched a lot of YouTube, so I think we'll be fine. Let's prove a point and mock that Muslim! All right, here we go, Roddy. Yeah! All right. Here we go, mate. Hey, Rodney, when Muslims go to heaven, they get 72 virgins. When you get there, there'll be 73. <laughs> I used to want to ban the burqa, but I changed my mind after seeing Rodney. Now I think men should have to wear them too. Yeah. <laughs> Is this what you want? <laughs> Rodney, you look ridiculous. Maybe ISIS should spend a bit more time cutting people's hair off. <laughs> Rodney, you're the opposite of Ramadan. Ramadan is a celibate fast. You're a slow fuck. <laughs> when Islamists see a drawing of Muhammad, they want to kill people. When they see a photo of Rodney, they want to kill themselves. <laughs> How you going, Rodney? I'm not even Muslim, Tom. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? No, don't clap. What? I'm actually a practicing Christian. You just think I'm Muslim because of the way I look. I'm really, I'm really offended. Rodney, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. That's awful. I, I apologise wholeheartedly, because as we all know, everybody, it is never OK to make fun of Christians. Rodney the Christian, everybody. Give it up for Rodney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Steve, Give it up for Rodney. <laughs> now it just seems like it's in poor taste, you know? <laughs> Speaking of Daisy Cousins, actually, in that same article in The Spectator, she wrote about her catchphrase about how conservatism is the new punk. And hey, I tell you what, she is not wrong. Hit it, Theresa May! <laughs> her hips do not lie. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, as cool as conservatism is, and I'm definitely on board, some of the lefty snowflakes who work here at the Gay BC aren't. <laughs> so-called tonightly writer and so-called comedian Jazz Twemlow, for example, insists on being left-wing. <laughs> I know. Well, we said he could do a piece for tonight's show, but only if he did something that left-wing people are not very good at, and that's self-critique. So here's his so-called piece. crumbling. <laughs> oh, hello there. I'm left-wing. You can probably tell from the cultural Marxism coming out of my face. Also, I work at the state-funded ABC, so we have to do this every morning. As a left-winger, I'm not particularly fond of the alt-right. Can't quite put my finger on it, but there's just something about online misogyny and the push for a pan-national white empire that ugh, just rubs me the wrong way. To be white is to be a striver a crusader, an explorer, and a conqueror. Despite questionable attitudes to ethnic minorities, alt-right videos keep breaking out all over the internet's face, a bit like racist herpes. They weren't always big-name public speakers and internet rock stars. They first started out in a weird petri dish of rebelliousness, irony, and trolling, often found in places like 4chan. And if you don't know what 4chan is, I've got some here in a jar. <laughs> That's right! It's just a typical online forum! The alt-right have somehow gone mainstream, gaining a rock-and-roll, anti-establishment vibe. But there's nothing very rock-and-roll about a bunch of white men hating multiculturalism. I don't remember Rage Against the Machine singing about the Jew problem or John Lennon's moving tribute to the white ethnostate. But let's not waste too much time pointing out that these pantomime villains are bad. The more interesting question is who is to blame for making neo-Nazis look like the new rock and roll punk? And the answer is unfortunately, partly, us. Don't get me wrong, I love left-wing values and hope that one day they'll win out across the globe. It's just that on that day, I don't want any actual left-wing people to be alive to see it happen. <laughs> Why? Because we're fucking useless. I mean, first of all, Brexit. What the fuck happened there? Well, uh, the left employed a cunning two-prong uh, strategy by, one, uh, calling every Leave voter a racist, and two, uh, failing to put forward a positive case uh, for Remain. Uh, right. Weird how not engaging 17 million Brits and slagging them off instead didn't win them over. But at least yelling, Ray! 
racist! Online made us feel good about ourselves and had no bad, long-lasting side effects. The UK has voted to leave the European Union. Ah, shit. Well, don't worry. After Brexit, we learnt our lesson. And then the US election came along and we thought, nah, let's just do that again. You could put <laughs> half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Not surprisingly, the left's campaign of vote for us, you pieces of shit, didn't pan out so well. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I said. Uh... But don't worry, it's not just the big battles. The left are totally useless on a small scale as well. This is largely thanks to the foul brick of nightmares we all have sewn into our hands, which means we're also bleeding woke all the time that we find something new to to be offended by every few seconds. Just for example, the movie Dunkirk is sexist, using the word wife is offensive, this cute kid is a massive racist, doctors saying your weight isn't healthy as fat shaming, Halloween costumes are a microaggression, Mark Twain is racist, in fairness he is 183 years old, we should have seen it coming, and practicing yoga is cultural genocide. Again, not quite the big picture issues the left used to be famous for. Look, the war in Vietnam's bad, but it's people trying to boost their core strength that's got me worried, you know. But don't try and point out that identity fueled online call-out culture is a worse idea than scrotum-flavoured chewing gum. If you criticise the left, apparently that means you stand against everything they stand for. In other words, you're a worse Nazi than a human centipede made entirely of Hitler's. All this makes the left about as open to dialogue and self-reflection as Gordon Ramsay on a meth spree. Fucking look at me, look at me eyes! Not as pissed as I am! You fucking are! To find out more about why this new outraged left is losing ground, and because I know this video is going to get backlash and I want someone else to share the blame, I sat down with moral philosopher and future doxing victim, Dr. Tim Dean. We're in an interview where we're going to constructively criticise the left. Um, why have I filled my pants? Well, it's the case these days that a lot of people on the left see any kind of criticism of their methods uh, as a criticism of their goals. And that makes the kind of discourse and the dialogue that we're having um, really uh, aggressive and quite corrosive as well. So why didn't calling Trump supporters racist and sexist help the Democrats win the election? I think that if you call a bunch of people sexist or racist but they don't believe that they are sexist or racist, um, all it's going to do is get them to rally around their own tribe and gather together and fight back. And that's exactly what we saw. I mean, how would you feel if I said you're entrenched in white privilege? I was going to raise that, actually, because we are two, two white men. White. I'm white. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a racist? <laughs> no, 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 neither am I. OK. Yeah. So this is fine. Well, we're just having a rational conversation. OK, <laughs> good. You got that? <laughs> This is fine. Well, traditionally, the left were in favour of things like, you know, world peace, equality for all, lots of lovely things. How is it the left is taking that sort of utopia and packaging it in a way that makes me want to swallow my own face? The way some people on the left have been thinking has changed. They're looking for any kind of signal that underneath you're actually a write-off. And so one slip of language, one slip of behaviour, and that shows that you're in the bad camp and you're just suddenly excluded. So the left lack nuance, they're too reactive to criticism and morally puritanical. Anything else? Well, why don't we talk about identity politics? Yeah, let's talk about that. The goals are absolutely noble, but one of the problems of identity politics is it breaks off these groups into these silos, into these kind of knowledge silos, and it stifles the possibility of engagement between those kinds of silos. So Tim, I want the left to win, you've got a beard, you obviously want the left to win as well. What can we do to stop losing the big battles and start generating some genuine systemic change? We've got to move beyond words, we've got to get practical. We can join a political party, even better, start a new political political party. Basically, just stop being some outraged virtue signalling prats. So, lefties, here's a sum up of what we need to do. And if you can ignore the offensive imagery long enough to listen to what I'm actually saying, we might not all die in an alt-right apocalypse. Stop reacting to pointless online provocateurs. Outrage is what they want, you make them look cool, and it distracts from bigger problems. Stop it with the moral purity and writing people off for making a single mistake. Try to understand the reasons behind someone's opinions and actions. And remember, calling someone a racist isn't going to unracist a racist. Get out of your bubble and off your devices. Social media is not your friend and destroys nuance. Instead, get outdoors, take up a hobby, <sighs> Broaden your horizons. Oh, that's... <laughs> Excuse me.
me. Can you stop doing that? Yoga is cultural appropriation. Oh, fuck's sake. Yeah, I'm Hitler and yoga's a problem. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Honestly, folks, I didn't think our next guest would have the guts to come on tonight's show. I assumed he'd be too busy giving a trigger warning to a Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've run out of them. For years, Chief Green's soy boy, Richard Di Natale, has urged governments to combat climate change, a.k.a. global conspiracy, invented by the Chinese to bankrupt my Uncle Glenn and hurt his investment portfolio. <laughs> Normally mild-mannered, during the recent leadership spill, Dean Natale went full spazzo, and I'm allowed to say that because political correctness isn't real. <laughs> and what have we got? We've got this spectacle, this disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You are so focused on yourselves that you have forgotten what the country elected you to do, and that is to govern for themselves, for them, not for you. Disgraceful. <laughs> he said that on the floor of the Senate, which is no place for ranting. It is a place reserved for praising the white Australia policy or just sitting quietly, OK? <laughs> that, was, that was the original mocker Muslim. <laughs> well, in Melbourne, to kick off his national speaking tour, which will be boring and bad, I destroyed Senator Dean Natale with my questions earlier today. Senator Richard Dean Natale, thanks for joining me on Conservative Lee. By that, I mean you disgust me. <laughs> Well, you discuss me. <laughs> uh, seems unnecessary. In your opinion, is it too early to say the Morrison government is the best government that Australia has ever had? Uh, in my opinion, it's far too early to say that, and in fact, I'd probably go in the opposite direction. He's doing better than you did when you were Prime Minister. <laughs> I haven't been Prime Minister yet, but I would, that's what I'd expect from a Conservative uh, talk show host. I'm sorry, I haven't done any research. Now, you're speaking in Melbourne tonight, and then you're embarking on a speaking tour around Australia. What can people expect to be bored by? <laughs> well, we're going to talk to people about a different sort of future, one where we look after each other, where we care for the environment, where we plan for the future, where we start taking action on climate change, make sure everybody's got a roof over their heads, make sure we do something about growing inequality in Australia and where we bring innocent refugees to Australia and look after them. All that global warming stuff, it's just alarmist hooey. If climate change is real, name me eight sources that agree with you. <laughs> It's called science, Tom. Uh, on one side of this debate, you've got uh, Albert Einstein and Isaac Newton. On the other side of this debate, you've got Tony Abbott and Donald Trump. I know which side I'm on. Great men. Great men. <laughs> Albert Einstein, absolutely. Uh, no, I meant the other one. Oh, God. Uh, now, you say the Greens will work with the Labor Party to tackle climate change. Are you teaming up with Labor because you think people don't hate the Greens enough? <laughs> no, because we've got to actually do something about dangerous climate change and we've had 10 years of revolving Prime Ministers, the madness has got to stop and we've actually we've got to start taking some action. So it's up, uh, up to the grown-ups in the room to uh, step up and that's what we're going to do. What do you do personally, Richard Di Natale, to combat climate change? Oh, well, I do quite a bit. Um, I uh, live off-grid, I've got a solar yeah. property where I've got some batteries. Uh, try to minimise uh, my carbon pollution as much as I can, yeah, unfortunately. Right, we get it. I was trying to catch you out. <laughs> Fucking hell. Uh, do you use plastic bags? Uh, no, I don't, actually. No. Paper and uh, reusable. Do you house a refugee in your house? Uh, no, not yet. Are you married to a man? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> you say that the uh, political discourse at the next election will be driven by fear and greed, what do you have against fearful and greedy Australians? I've got a lot against uh, politicians who exploit fear and greed rather than plan for the future, and that's what we got with his government. Do you and the Greens support the ABC? We're huge fans and supporters of the ABC and SBS. We think our public broadcasters do a fantastic job. Even tonight with Tom Ballard? There's a few exceptions, but mostly the ABC do a great job. Well, I'm glad that there's one thing we can agree on. Senator Richard Di Natale, thank you for your time. I wish you nothing but failure. <laughs> Good on you. Likewise. Our stand-up guest tonight is here in the interest of balance. He's the star of the hit web series Gale and is set to perform two different shows this week at the Giant Dwarf Theatre in Sydney on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Please welcome the so-called comedian and very funny Chris Fleming. <laughs> Wicked, wicked witch style. 
That was the tableau I was going for, the Wicked Witch's burial ground right there. Um, I'm very worried that my countrymen don't understand the irony of tonight's episode and think I've, I've gone overseas and become radicalized. Um, and yeah, and I just took the three-week flight over here from America, so I, that's, I apologize uh, for looking disheveled or uh, looking like Shelley Duvall in The Shining. Right. <laughs> holding items from the garage, you know? She's, do you guys know the grunge icon, Shelley Duvall? Okay, no, all right. I was just in the South. Uh, I was coming from the South of my country, which is very much like the, the, the tone of tonight's show, the South. It's very conservative. Uh, when, and then when this uh, fruity business walks into a gas station down, they have a hard time with this in the South. When, when this walks in, it gets like a lot of like... But I notice there's a big difference between this... And this, ah, when this walks in, it gets a, how you doing, buddy? Okay. I'm not thrilled about what's happening, but you seem to be on the right track. This is just a Pomeranian who's by at best, by at best case scenario. This, okay, he hunts poorly, but he hunts nonetheless. <laughs> I'm breaking the number one rule of stand-up right now. Uh, that I took, I took a course with, from this little guy, and he said, if you don't take the microphone out of the stand in the first 15 seconds, you're screwed. <laughs> so for like the first 10 years of doing stand-up, he'd be like, give it up for Chris Fleming. And I'd be like, how's everybody doing tonight? Are we drinking? Are we drinking? Are we dating? Are we dating? <laughs> Uh, I, I feel like about 80% of, of, of uh, my adult life is meeting people I don't care about's boyfriends. And, <laughs> and I come from a really grotesque uh, social circle. There's like a real like study abroad vibe going on. <laughs> you know, a lot of guys like to talk to you about ghee, the Indian butter, and tell you about the benefit. I feel like it's only a matter of time till I meet someone's boyfriend who's just on all fours and explains to me the whole time why it's beneficial to be on all fours. <laughs> like, uh, cheers, I'm Nicholas. You know, humans aren't actually meant to walk on two feet. I've never had more energy, and I've never felt better. I learned this while studying abroad in Hanoi and making my host family's life miserable. <laughs> And making 12-page single-space Facebook posts about how men need to stop taking up so much space. <laughs> I'm also a bit of a film buff. <laughs> Did you know that it took them three weeks to shoot the cover photo for Free Willy? Because every time the whale jumped over the boy, he kept knocking him over with his giant whale dick? <laughs> Not a lot of people know that. Free Willy, it's on Netflix. Oh, wow, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Free Willy's on Netflix, check it out. Uh, Netflix has really been pushing it with their assumptions lately. Because you watched Seabiscuit, here are more movies with lean background actors. <laughs> what? Here are more equine dramas that employ a pansexual gaffer. But what? <laughs> How is that an algorithm? <laughs> I make online videos for a living. The, the disgraced term is YouTuber, but um, in, in, my, in my country, uh, anyone who claims to be, whenever someone claims to be a YouTuber who's over 25, I, I feel like a polar bear falls somewhere whenever. <laughs> just, just doesn't die, just like, ouch, you know, ow. <laughs> ouch, ouch. <laughs> Um, and so I get these, these emails all the time from like these new digital companies, like bidjo.tv, these like really crummy digital companies. And they'll be like, hey, Chris, spelling my name with like a K and two Z's. Hey, Chris, it's Ty from bidjo.tv. Recently came across your channel. Love what you're up to. Was wondering if you want to come make bad videos for us for free and live in a well in our yard. <laughs> Every morning, we'll splash you with a bucket of half and half. Then we'll taunt you with photos of your loved ones to inspire you to make that free content. Then we'll feed you birdseed out of an old Tonka truck, you piece of shit. <laughs> Delete. Then he'll write back two weeks later and got my name was completely wrong. Just like, hey, Josh! Just circling back! 
wondered if you thought about my offer. We recently signed a new distribution deal with Samsung Galaxies. You know, the phones that blow up on planes. We want to put your videos in zoo gift shop bathrooms. But instead of paying you money, we want to tie you to a wayward donkey who's then going to take you to your old middle school crush's houses. Only the primary school crush's houses. <laughs> Only the ones that are now married. And there's going to be a boombox blasting Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On full blast. <laughs> Speaking of Celine and Full Blast, I, uh, I'll get out of your hair in a, in right now, but I, um, am I the only one who gets a rush of adrenaline when the radio DJ cuts his dismount a little too close to the song's beginning? <laughs> You're listening to 94.1 The Patch FM. I'm Mike Sacklaridis, and we're having the smoothest time here today. Let me just say something real quick. I love my job. Let me say that one more time. I love my job. Then the background you hear, do 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 boo do. You gotta get out of there, Mike! <laughs> Tracy Chapman's nipping at your heels, buddy! <laughs> I'm here by the pool today with my son, Jakob. We're raising him by. My wife's here. She's also named Jakob. We've been getting into a lot of belly button play. It saved our marriage. That is the final acoustic warning shot that the USS Chapman is going to fire Mike. And I'll be here whenever you need me at the smoothest spot on the radio. 94.1, the patch here is Tracy Chapman. You got a fast car. Oh! Shit, Mike! You crazy son of a bitch! Thank you. Chris Fleming, everybody. Oh, that was the best. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching, particularly if you're a member of the government.